Okay, mine about five miles. Yes, so the five Mariana path, this, okay. So now that you've understood, I guess, I hope, <laughs> the Hinayana path, well, I have some idea of what these stages are all about. Um, then next is the Mahayana path, which is quite similar, a lot of similarities. Um, Mahayana path is quite similar. Well, first of all, you need something that allows you what is called enter, as it's described, like enter into the Mahayana path. There's like a, um, a gateway. So here, very specifically, they talk about the gateway, the entryway into the Mahayana path, which is Buddhicitta, the mind of enlightenment. What is the mind of enlightenment? How would you describe the mind of enlightenment? <laughs> really nice. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, that's good. But more specifically, <laughs> okay, it's the wish to attain enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. How many types of aspiration do you need to have? How many wishes do you need to have? Like, like, what? How many types of aspiration? Two. 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 What are those two? The wish to benefit sentient beings and the wish to become enlightened. So the wish to benefit sentient beings and the wish to become enlightened. Of those two, which one is more important? First one or second? What? No wings. <laughs> Two or three people doing this. <laughs> A drunk bird. <laughs> okay, so, all right, again, which one is more important? To benefit sentient beings. So, to benefit sentient beings, that is the main aspiration of the two. Okay, so this is compared to. Wishing for water, because you're thirsty, and wishing for a glass. Which one do you think is the analogy for wishing to benefit sentient being, beings, and which one is uh, the aspiration to become enlightened? Which of those two? Which one refers to wishing for water and wishing for a glass? Pardon? Water is sentient being. So your main aim, your main aspiration is to benefit sentient beings. And as it happened to be, the best means, from a Buddhist point of view, the best way to benefit sentient beings is to take them to enlightenment. That's the greatest state of happiness. So really your wish is, in a way it's almost three aspirations. You wish for all sentient beings to have the greatest happiness. And what happens to be the greatest happiness? Enlightenment. So you wish them to be enlightened. But you can only attain enlightenment, you can only lead them to enlightenment if you yourself are enlightened, so you wish for enlightenment. Right? If it was making the best ice cream in the world would be the best to benefit sentient beings, that's what you wish for. I mean, it sounds bizarre, but it's really Buddhahood is just a means to kind of fulfilling this first wish, the wish to become to the wish to bring the great, greatest happiness to sentient beings. We don't even wish that for ourselves. So at this stage, bodhicitta is really difficult. We don't even wish for ourselves. So actually, the wish to get out of samsara should precede the wish to have bodhicitta. Okay? Oh, sorry, it should precede the wish for all sentient beings to have the greatest happiness. So first, you yourself want to have, out of samsara at least, then you wish for other sentient beings to be out of samsara, you wish for other sentient beings to be out of samsara, even greater to become Buddhas, and then you yourself want to become Buddhas to benefit other sentient beings. But when we say the wish for ourselves to be free from suffering, we're not talking about entering the Hinayana path. Because when you enter the Hinayana path, you want to just attain liberation. All you want is out of samsara and you're not thinking about becoming fully enlightened. Okay? So with 
here with bodhicitta that has to be preceded by the wish to be free from samsara, in the back of your mind you want more than that. It's, you, you're not satisfied merely um, with overcoming samsara, but it needs to precede your wish for other sentient beings to overcome samsara. So first you wish it for yourself, and then you direct it towards sentient beings, and you go even further. Greater happiness, than, greater happiness than nirvana. There's a state like in full Buddhahood, sentient beings experience a greater degree of, of well-being, they're able to remove all their shortcomings, and that's why you wish for that. Okay, So that's bodhicitta, really. And it's really not easy. We don't even want for ourselves to be free from samsara. How can we wish for other sentient beings? I mean, we have no idea what the state beyond is. We haven't really thought about it. We haven't really thought about the shortcomings of samsara. Um, I mean... Like, rebirth is, or is difficult. So the fact we're reborn, but let's say we accept there's rebirth. I mean, do we want to do this over and over and over and over and over and over again? No, actually, to think about this possibility, and so to not be reborn, and also to see that even our happy states, our happiness, is merely the temporary absence of something worse. And so just as you would call minus 10 degrees in comparison to t- minus 20 degrees, you would call that warm. Likewise, we call our kinds of happiness, happiness because it's better than a worse type of suffering. So that's why we call it happiness. But in actuality, it's just another form of suffering. Uh, except we don't recognize it because that's the best we can experience at this point in time. So to really get a sense that we are... We are in a situation where we experience so many problems, and on top of that, even our suffering is so limited, uh, our happiness is so limited, so the wish to get out of it, and then you look around and you realize, well, I'm not alone in this. Everyone else is in this too. All other sentient beings are trapped in the same way. And in my case, at least I've I've have developed, developed an interest. I'm trying I'm moving towards some spiritual way of life um, and to give my very best to live a spiritual life. There are all these people around that they're not even interested and to sincerely generate concern for them. And, of course, I can only interest them, really, if I know exactly what to say to them. I don't know what sparks someone's interest, right? So a Buddha would be someone who knows exactly the other person's mind knows exactly what they need. So I really just want to be a Buddha to be of the greatest benefit to all sentient beings. I can walk up to someone and basically tell them the right thing that will eventually, maybe not right away, but eventually lead them towards the Dharma. And of course, it needs, the, the stronger your karmic connection with that person, the better. So when you see some of the Lamas, it's easily misunderstood. It's so bizarre how the same behavior that the lamas express or that manifest sometimes can be misunderstood. I remember some years ago his homeless came to Germany and because my father had a stroke and he's in a wheelchair and he can no longer walk or talk, um, but he's still very alert and everything and I wanted him to have an audience with his holiness. Um, so, just a short one, because he can't come to Dharamsala. And he had seen his wholeness when he was better in Dharamsala, but that was many years ago. So, anyway, I organized that, and it was so amazing. His wholeness was so kind to my dad. It was really amazing. My, my dad caught all the photographs of his wholeness and put them next to his bed. He still has, like, a whole thing. It's like, after that audience, <clears throat> his wholeness was so kind with him. Anyway, but the thing is, um, so his homeless talked a little bit. He, he made this prayer. He touched my, my dad's forehead with his own, and he stood there for a long time just praying. My dad just didn't move. He was like <laughs> frozen. <laughs> and he did all these prayers, and, you know, they very kind. Um, and um, then, we, then he said, okay, let's take the photograph. So the rest of my family was there, my, my dad's second wife, my mom, myself, we were all there. And we took a photograph. And when my sister saw this, She's like, oh, now he wants to get a picture with a guy in a wheelchair. And I'm like, oh. And so I had to explain to her, I said, look, he's not like he's got his own photo album, like, carrying around. Look, here's me with a guy in a wheelchair. I mean, that's, it's just, I mean, like, 
I was so shocked when she said that. But then I thought, oh, well, if you don't know anything about someone and they say, let's take a picture, yeah, you can misunderstand that. I kind of got that and I thought, oh, I have to be careful. I was like, look how kind this one is. Now we can get a picture. Well, now we got a picture. And she's like, and that's how she interpreted it. Like my uncle, right? With the smiling. My sister's with a <laughs> photograph. So I explained and explained and I don't know, I think in the end she did kind of get it, right? It's like just for us. I mean, that's one. this doesn't keep those pictures, it doesn't have those pictures. But anyway, um, but then the next thing, what his homeless tries to do at all times is to meet new people all the time, make connection, make connections with people. Now that you have to do, you have to create karmic connections because the more connections you, you generate now, the more can you be of benefit to sentient beings? Because it's the whole thing. That's why we try to become enlightened. There are so many Buddhas before us. I mean, they can take over. They can do it, basically. There's always this argument also in the text. Well, there are all these other ones. Why shouldn't they do? Why can't they do it? Why do I have to become a Buddha? Mm -hmm. But it's basically because we have unique karmic connections with sentient beings that they may not have. <coughs> And the more karmic connections, the better. So with some, of course, they have some. So the lamas, they reach out all the time. So there are these stories, really beautiful stories. When his holiness, for instance, um, went to... It's in one of the books about happiness. I forget. The Art of Happiness, I think, is in there. How his homeless in a, in, a, in a hotel, he walks up to these maids, like just one maid, and he talks to her, and it's really special, and she's like, ooh probably never heard about him or about Buddhism, wasn't interested. I mean, probably wasn't a Buddhist, maybe Catholic. I think the the, the maid in that um, hotel was from South America. So anyway, so she was like, ooh. And so whoever wrote this, they, they were observing that. The next day, there were two maids. And then the next day, three, four. And at the end of his homeless visits, all the maids that knew each other from the surrounding hotels had come together and wait for his homeless. They were all like, wow, who is this man? He's so kind, right? And they were all in awe. And ah, it's just so beautiful. And when his homeless went to Germany many years ago, I only heard this from other people. I didn't know about it. But there's a, a center in Hamburg, Hamburg that I'm associated with, and they also have a center somewhere in an area nearby. It's called Lüneburger Heide. It's considered to be really beautiful. And so they used to have a color chakra there. They had a color chakra there oh. at some point. They had one there. So this is said to be a very special area. And I think his homeless probably chose it, and so they did the color chakra. Um, so I'm just at the Kalachak were there. And since that time, in that area, there are now five, five or six different Dharma centers that offer retreats, and etc. And the story goes that when his holiness went there to give the initiation, he stopped at stores, he went into shops and talked to the people inside. There's a story where he, he stopped the car where, that he was in, and, and there was a crossing with a huge truck, and he went up to the truck, he opened the door and talked to the truck driver. <laughs> so he connected with so many people that some people say he's our Dalai Lama <laughs> in that area. And when we come in ropes, this is one of the places in that particular place, people know who we are and they react very positively. They don't ignore us, they don't pretend they don't see us or think we're crazy or something. But when we like that, <laughs> but they, wherever you go in the restaurant, they're like very friendly and they're there's like a small nunnery. It only has a few nuns that just started. So um, this is... Pardon? The name of the place? It's really long. Lüneburger Heide. But I forg that's the whole area. <laughs> and that is the whole area. But I forget the exact name of the town now. I've forgotten that. I'll remember again later. But Yeah, you can Google it. Yeah, Hamburg, Tibet. Germany. Somewhere in Germany. Yeah, North Germany. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so in that place, it was so... It was so obvious how his homeless tried to connect to people. So you see the lamas doing that. They try to connect to people, not because they want to be popular. This is how it could be seen, you know, like with a photograph. Oh, they just want to be popular. They want to know a lot of people. But no, not at all. They sincerely care for everyone, but connecting with them means, oh, in the future I can help you. Now I talk to you, kind of thing. Or in the future, I mean, if he's already a Buddha now, well, again, making connection. There's now we we have the karma to have his holiness around, right now, right. And so during that time, we we can have him around, so he can make 
contact with us, etc. And he tries to connect with as many people as possible. Okay? So this is how it's seen. It may seem weird, like we have the karma. It's not like the other way around. But, well, if you learn about Buddhism, if you study about it, it makes all sense. At that point, it really makes sense. I mean, if someone has reached that level. Okay, now... If you get a bit of a sense there for what bodhicitta is, it's driven by this incredible love and care for sentient beings. Of course, there's a reason, there's a technique, that there are two techniques, in fact, that both in combination, are, it's, it's advice that we practice those in combination. Um, and um, I think you're aware of those, I don't need to mention them. Are you aware of them, the two techniques? Who's not? Oh, equalizing and exchanging self with others, and the seven call for cause and effect. Oh, seven, six causes and one effect. Okay, great. So that's the criterion. Therefore, once you have bodhicitta, that is the mind that effortlessly wants to. And now you're saying it's un, they call it uncontrived, where you don't have to kind of make an effort, like a great effort, like thinking, oh, may I become enlightened? No. After some habituation, after some familiarity, it arises spontaneously. It just, if it's, it's, like it's, it's like in any moment it can pop up and it influences you during all your actions. That type of, like they call it uncontrived, spontaneous, effortless, contrived as in like artificial kind of like, you know, right now it's kind of artificial. Oh, I should generate bodhicitta, okay, right? But it's not really like the cause that you want for all sentient beings to have happiness and feel that from your heart hasn't really gone first. We haven't developed that care for sentient beings yes, yet. So it's beautiful to generate the mind. It leaves strong imprints in the mind. But to think we've entered the Mayana path, no. This is also quite important. Some years ago, someone said to me, what about it? Isn't it so hard to be a Bodhisattva? And I was like, no. And she's like, well, I'm a Bodhisattva. And I was like, what? But wow. she's she's not a, no, but she's not she's not she's not someone who's arrogant, etc. She just totally misunderstood. She said, I want to be a Buddha. <laughs> so she thought, if you wish to be a Buddha for whatever reason, that makes you a Bodhisattva. She hadn't studied Dharma that much, so she just assumed anyone who wishes to be a Buddha, because that's kind of nice, is a Bodhisattva. It was totally innocent. Right? Really cute, right? <laughs> I'm a Bodhisattva. And he's like, what? <laughs> Don't say that to <laughs> Don't say that to anyone who may hear you. And so then, of course, explaining it, what that meant, she's like, oh, oh no, I'm not a Bodhisattva. <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. So, um, but having said this, so when this mind spontaneously arises, driven by this love and care for other sentient beings, really putting others before yourself. You reach that point where your self-grasping, self-centeredness is no longer in the forefront. It is still there. You haven't eliminated it yet, because otherwise you wouldn't have to enter the path. You've already basically eliminated it. No, it's still there, but it's weakened to such a degree that you automatically put others before you. It's always others' welfare, right? But of course, with a certain degree of wisdom, you still look after your health, you look after your, your body, that you're strong enough to fulfill that wish, which is your main wish. You're, you're wishing mainly for that. And then having understood that enlightenment is the best way to, to fulfill your first, your primary wish, then you set out, uh, well, to generate the wish to become enlightened, of course, and then to work towards it. Okay, so that's bodhicitta. Bodhicitta refers to the sincere and spontaneous aspiration to overcome the cognitive obstructions. So becoming a Buddha means really to overcome whatever is in the way to becoming a Buddha. That is namely the cognitive obstructions. Of course, you need to also eliminate the afflictive ones, but that's not your main goal. It's you only want to overcome the afflictive obstructions because without overcoming those, you can't get rid of the cognitive ones. Like, without removing the garlic from the vessel, you can't remove the smell from the vessel. But that's not your main goal. You mainly focus on the cognitive ones and to become a Buddha. That's your main aspiration. For the benefit of all sentient beings, which in, for the benefit of all sentient beings, that indicates the first aspiration, the stronger aspiration, the wish to benefit all sentient beings, for them to have happiness and so forth. Such an aspiration to become a Buddha can only arise after intense and prolonged contemplation of the suffering existence of all sentient beings. First of all, of our own, and then, of course, of all other sentient beings. Once Mayana practitioners, that is, bodhisattvas, 
So that's the same. A Mahayana practitioner and a Bodhisattva are synonyms. Have cultivated the Bodhicitta and thereby the path of accumulation, they need to accumulate sufficient merit and wisdom to be able to proceed. Same as before. The aspiration was a different one. So it's again, it's a, the gateway to a path of accumulation, whether it's the Hinayana or the Mahayana, is the aspiration to reach a certain goal. Okay. And the, to enter the, the Mahayana path of accumulation, that's, it's really bizarre. You cannot, become a, you, cannot, you cannot enter the Mahayana path if you wish to become a Buddha for yourself. It doesn't work. This, it's the, the love and compassion, they have to be so strong your love and compassion for other sentient beings has to be so strong um, that your wisdom realizing emptiness, once you've developed it, is strong enough to remove all the obscurations. Okay? Otherwise, without that type of love and compassion, your wisdom doesn't become strong enough. This is why you wouldn't even enter the Mayana path. It wouldn't, you wouldn't fulfill the criterion. And you certainly wouldn't move on Unless, of course, you wanted to become self-liberated, just become liberated, that is also a very strong motivation. But the, the only one of those two would make your wisdom realizing emptiness directly, would give it the strength to overcome these two obscurations. So from a Buddhist point of view, you can't even realize emptiness directly without having those two aspirations. Right? Get out of samsara. Because if you don't have that aspiration to get out of samsara, what keeps you in samsara is the self-grasping attitude. So to realize emptiness directly, you need to have the wish to overcome that self-grasping attitude. Otherwise, the, it doesn't... I mean, to, to realize emptiness directly. Not just to realize emptiness, but directly. Okay? So that seems a little bizarre at first. But if you reflect <coughs> upon this further, you think about this further, it makes total sense. Okay. Otherwise, why would you want to realize emptiness directly? Right? Why? It doesn't, it's not necessary unless you want to be enlightened, or you want to be liberated or enlightened. You don't need to. Just realizing it is fine. But you have a goal that you want to do something with that mind that realizes emptiness directly. Okay. Anyway, so once you have bodhicitta, you have entered now what is called the Mahayana path. Um, you now need to accumulate wisdom and, and merit. So this is the reason for calling this path the path of accumulation. But this time the Mahayana, because the goal is a different one. Furthermore, bodhisattvas need to generate an inferential cognizer, realizing the emptiness of intrinsic existence. Now, this is needed. If you want to further move on further, you need to generate that. In other words, unless bodhisattvas realized emptiness before they entered the path of accumulation, that's also possible, as before with the Hinayana path, you could realize emptiness before. It's actually seen to be better actually seem to be better. If you understand emptiness, then generating renunciation in the case of the Hinayana path or Bodhicitta in the case of the Mahayana path, well, your understanding is so much greater. You understand that Buddhahood is possible because you understand that the self-grasping attitude is a wrong consciousness. If you realize emptiness, you know that the self-grasping attitude is a wrong consciousness. right? We don't know that right now. If you know that the self-grasping attitude is a wrong consciousness, you know that the object doesn't exist. What do you know that, that what does that mean? You know that inherent existence doesn't exist. That means you have no emptiness, you've realized emptiness. Therefore, if you realize emptiness, then you really understand that the self-grasping, that is the mind that grasps that the mind that holds on to inherent existence, that, that is a wrong consciousness. And then it makes sense that you can remove it. Any wrong consciousness can be removed if you just kind of adjust what you're perceiving. Okay? Um, in that sense, it makes total sense that you can become enlightened, that you can become liberated, and the wish to become liberated grows that much stronger. If you know it's a possibility, it's not just faith that you can become enlightened. In fact, you can only understand liberation and enlightenment if you realize, you can realize it. You can only realize liberation the state of liberation and the state of enlightenment once you have realized emptiness. Realize why? Because you need to realize that, as I just said, that it is possible to eliminate ignorance. How do you understand that you can, that you can eliminate ignorance? By understanding that it's a wrong view. How do you understand that it's a wrong view? By understanding emptiness. Does that make sense? No, you're talking about conceptual understanding. 
yes, yes, only conceptual, of course, just conceptual, initial conceptual understanding. So if you conceptually understand emptiness is possible, you know that ignorance is the wrong consciousness, you know, therefore, you can remove it. And if you can remove it, what is the removal of ignorance? Well, first liberation, and then if you remove even the imprints, then enlightenment. Okay? So therefore, it's said to be better to realize emptiness first, and then to generate bodhicitta. But it's a personal thing. Some people, they may prefer to meditate on, on bodhicitta, on love and compassion. They're not that drawn to emptiness. They're not that interested. And they may actually first generate bodhicitta, and then slowly, of course, pay attention to emptiness, because otherwise they can't proceed. And then there are others who are more interested in emptiness first. They think about it, they talk about it, they analyze it, they meditate on it, and eventually realize emptiness. But then they cannot enter a path unless they wish now either to be liberated, self-liberated, like liberate themselves, or bring happiness to all sentient beings, and for that purpose then become enlightened. Does that make sense? So unless bodhisattvas realize emptiness before they enter the path of accumulation, which is better, but I didn't mention this, never mind, they must now reflect on the various reasons that establish the ultimate nature of reality until they're able to infer the lack of intrinsic existence of phenomena and thereby newly and conceptually realize emptiness. That is, realize emptiness with an inferential cognizer. Same as before, same sentence. Right? <laughs> so, so it's really very similar, except for the aspiration. That's a different one. So initially, in particular, just with regard to the realization of emptiness, it's very similar. On top of that, bodhisattvas must develop calm abiding, right? Also, in order to move on to the path of preparation, which is also the criterion for that, is also to generate the union of calm abiding and special insight, as you already know how you can develop that. Well, calm abiding, you need to at least, unless you've already developed it, now you need to develop calm abiding. Come abiding. So, therefore, on top of... Do we need to take a break? Is it time to no. take a break? No? No, okay. <laughs> Maybe you had too much coffee in the morning. On top of that, bodhisattvas must develop calm abiding, a special concentration that is able to focus uninterruptedly on an internal object with calmness, clarity, and intent. Okay, I don't have to say that again. I need to take that out next time. For at least four hours. Following that, calm abiding that focuses, for instance, on the image of the body of the Buddha, on the analytical meditation, and so forth. So that is conceptual consciousness realizing. Emptiness are ha harmonized now. Okay, so same idea. Same idea as before. You develop calm abiding based on a different object, and now you alternate them. You alternate them. Focus on the image of the Buddha, okay, for a few moments until your mind becomes very calm. Let's say you, you chose the image of the Buddha your mind becomes very calm. Then, you, you, when you feel the mind is very calm, you start analyzing emptiness. A mind that's calm is when it's lost, then you again go back to the image of the Buddha. Right? Until you go back and forth so many times that even though you think of emptiness, now you do not need to change back to the image of the Buddha because your mind remains calm. And you can think about emptiness, there's even a subtle analysis of emptiness, without the mind being disturbed. So that moment um, is the moment when you have reached what is called, when you have attained the union of calm abiding and special insight, taking emptiness as your object, that is realizing emptiness conceptually. And that is the first moment of the Mahayana path of preparation. Why is it the Mahayana path of preparation? Because this union is conjoined with bodhicitta. Although when that union arises, the union of calm abiding and special insight, bodhicitta is not present. But you've heard yesterday <coughs> and before, you heard about when the mind lies dormant, it still affects the other awarenesses. So a bodhisattva is someone who has developed bodhicitta and whose bodhicitta is either actively there or it lies dormant. You can lose bodhicitta. But only at the very beginning, as I said yesterday with regard to the um, aspiration to become liberated or renunciation, that mind you can also initially lose. So there's a lot of explanation or a lot of, well, explanation as in like you're warned basically in the scriptures telling you once you have bodhicitta, you can initially lose it. Okay? How do you lose bodhicitta? If you don't make conceptual. Pardon? 
no, 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 no. When you, have, if you don't have conceptual realization of emptiness or something, you don't lose bodhicitta. How do you lose bodhicitta? Very easy to lose it. No, not anger, not anger. Anger? Oh my God, no. But how, what, what more? I mean, those are the causes, right? If you harm another being? No, no, just harming another being is not enough to lose it. What happens? You focus on the ego, we focus on the ego even at that state. We kind of do, but like what did you say just now? If your benefit is, if your motivation is not the benefit of all sentient beings. If you just let go of one sentient being. Right? So the story goes, you meet an obnoxious person, they give you a really hard time and you go, for this being, no, they're out. <laughs> that is all sentient beings minus one, that means you're out, you lose bodhicitta. So it really just needs one obnoxious person and so the, like they, they maybe you find them difficult and you spend some time with them and if you catch yourself thinking or if you just think, well, I'll work for the benefit of all sentient beings but not that one. <laughs> right? Okay? So we may think that. And that is O minus 1, which means Bodhicitta is gone. <laughs> right? But of course, you were already quite advanced just having that mind. Right? Having that mind, that's amazing. Um, so just being angry with sentient beings without letting go of your wish to benefit them. All right, for a moment you're angry. All right? But you don't let go of that wish. So, of course, when you reach that level, anger is not like our ordinary anger. It may just be a short moment of resentment, and then the person right away applies the antidote. And even if they're kind of well with it, well in the anger for some time, um, doesn't mean that they give up that inspiration and, or that aspiration. But, um, yeah, so there are stories of what, when, you know, they count, like a great, like a bodhisattva encountered someone, and they gave them such a hard time, and they were like, ugh, you know, sentient beings are such a, so bothersome, like, they, oh, I can't do that kind of idea. Or, well, just that person, no, that person is just too much. <laughs> Out. <laughs> and that's it, you fall from, yeah. And you get it back if you regret it? Yes, of course, you get it back easily. That's what I was going to say, actually, I got, I got sidetracked. Like, that's exactly, because you have already gone that far, so then it doesn't take that long to get back to it, right? You could be like an hour, you know, Bodhisattva, and then you go back. Could be as, as little as that, like going like, oh, come on, I'm, like you know, do the right kind of analysis and then go back. Do you realize all these processes that you are Bodhisattva? Or do you realize you're Bodhisattva? Okay, that's a good question. Do you realize you're a Bodhisattva? I think initially you may not. I'm not sure. You don't know whether it's like effortless. Like, really, is it driven? I think maybe initially, a lot of people are probably aware, but in some cases you may, if you're like super humble, then maybe you think, oh no, but it's not strong enough. I mean, you realize that there's a mind wishing to become enlightened and you have a lot of love, but whether it's that uncontract, spontaneous one, because spontaneous is also relative, like how spontaneous does it, does it have to arise, right? Are all your actions now influenced by that? You may not be aware of that. But I guess in a, in a lot of cases, people are aware. Um, and then their teachers may even recognize that. As long as the Dalai Lama has talked about certain practitioners, it's rare, but he sometimes says, oh, this person is a bodhisattva. His home is the da- Oh, I don't know. Forget now. <laughs> <laughs> I think in the past he said it on a few... I mean, nowadays, it's... I haven't, like... Really, I mean, his home is sometimes said he's a completion stage practitioner. If he says that about someone, by implication, he's a bodhisattva. You cannot be a highest yoga tantric practitioner without being a bodhisattva. Does anyone know why? There's a technical aspect to it. A lot of people don't know that. To be a highest yoga tantric initiation, uh, highest yoga tantric practitioner, you must have the tantric vow. To have the tantric vow, you must have the bodhisattva vow. Okay. And which of the bodhisattva vow, I mean, there are many vows. I say bodhisattva vow because if you break one of them, you don't have still other bodhisattva vows. You lost the bodhisattva vow. That's why I use the singular, right? So you have many vows that are part of the bodhisattva vow. So if you lose, there's one specific one on the basis of which you know you have to be a bodhisattva to take the bodhisattva, to receive the bodhisattva vow. You can take it, but you don't necessarily receive it. So even if you take high yoga tantric initiations without being a bodhisattva, you don't receive the initiation. Okay? 
I said I didn't say that before, but that's true. Why? Because you, when you take the highest of tantric initiation, you take the Bodhisattva, the tantric vow, which is based on the Bodhisattva vow. Now, which vow in the Bodhisattva vow, of the different vows implies that you have to be a Bodhisattva? Does anyone know? It's very simple. Giving up love for one sentient being. It's not Pardon? Like giving up love for one sentient being. No. Don't give up bodhicitta. There's one vow. You cannot give up bodhicitta. Well, if you don't have bodhicitta, how can you take that vow? Does that make sense? There's a vow that you're not allowed to give up bodhicitta. Well, if you don't have bodhicitta, how can you take a vow, right, to not give up bodhicitta? That's so... A lot of people feel very disturbed. They feel very disappointed when they realize... Hmm, I took the Bodhisattva vow many times, but I never really got it. I mean, come on, what is disappointed? You never got it. Big deal. You still took it, and it's great. We left great imprints, etc. So no reason not to take it. You should take it, because it leaves great imprints in your mind every time you get closer to be able to develop that mind one day. So it's a good thing to take it, but just be aware you don't fully get it. And be aware you don't get the Tantric vow fully. And be aware you don't get the initiation it's okay. You do what you can. But that, I think, is helpful. I, I want to stress this again and again. So people who are very inclined to practice high yoga tantra realize it's not the full deal mm-hmm. and, and not get carried away. Does it apply to the three lower tantras? Pardon? Is it the same for the three lower tantras as well? Uh, well, for the two lower... For, in the Tibetan tradition, really, the, the, the only other initiations are usually, with some exception, but usually it's just the first stage, Kriya tantra. And in those, you don't get the tantric vow. So, no problem. But then how do you know, like, how do you know whether you've uh, received the vow or not? Whether you have the Vichita or not? I mean... It doesn't matter. You just do what you can. Whether you don't know, it's also not a big deal. You just continue practicing. You have a teacher, usually. Mm-hmm. I mean, you very much rely on your teacher. Um, so, it's good to have, like, a, um, a spiritual teacher... Like a highly a well, I mean a good qualified, I mean a quali- fully qualified, like His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Okay. Now then, people say, well, I can't really meet him. You don't need to meet him if you're at that point. Somehow, the, the, this Holiness will communicate with you. Your teacher will communicate with you, so you don't need to worry. I'm I'm pretty sure that that once you reach that level, that they, if you haven't found out yet, and that becomes an obstacle to your practice, it'll be pointed out to you. No worries. But first we have to get there, right? I'm pretty sure. So most people, I don't know, I think you really become so aware and mindful of your own so that you kind of go, well, I'm pretty sure. Especially initially it may be difficult, but once it becomes stronger and stronger because the mind becomes stronger. If you don't lose it, it becomes stronger. And then you notice yourself, you've totally let gone, go of your... I mean, most of the time your own benefit is is only... You only wish for your own benefit after you make sure everyone else has been benefited. So you don't totally ignore yourself, of course, but it's not your prime concern any longer. At some point, I guess you realize that's true, right? In, in, I mean, we all know when we're selfish. We all know when we put our own happiness before ourselves. And I mean, I guess most times people are aware. And anyway, you just continue with what you're doing, whether you're aware or not, right? You just continue with what you're doing. Okay, we have, but we have more time for questions after. Okay? Can we, can we wait, please, Nikita? Okay, now, just to be able to finish this. Now, um, so once you have, like I said, you have bodhicitta, you work towards realizing emptiness, unless you've already realized it, calm abiding, etc., Okay, and work towards now generating the union of calm abiding and special insight. All right. So as before, um, taking emptiness as the object. So I don't need to read that whole paragraph. Um, two awarenesses that now work together as com- common to mental factors, both realizing emptiness. Um, and so they operate parallel with equal power, one assisting the other. Okay. But... It is just a conceptual mind, of course. It's only a conceptual consciousness and therefore unable to act as a direct antidote to any of the afflictive obstructions. And then when Bodhisattvas arise from that conceptual realization of emptiness that is such a union, they have to, of course, continue with their practice of love, compassion, and so forth. Okay? In fact, they have to take the Bodhisattva vow on the path of accumulation. They have to already take the vow. 
So at some point, the, the vow is given to them. Okay. Mm-hmm. So the, the the on the middling they call it the path of accumulation is divided into three periods, like three times: small, middling, and great. And on the middling, you have to take the bodhisattva vow necessarily. So you take the vow because it gives your bodhicitta that much more strength. Again, I talked about vows before, how they have an effect on our mind. Well, that is true also in this case here. Anyway, so once you moved on now on the path of preparation, once you attained that particular mind, it's just described, well, you come out and you work for the benefit of others. Okay? And then, okay, it's called path of preparation because now you're preparing for realizing emptiness directly, which is then the path of seeing, as before. As before, it's the path of seeing, is defined or is, is um, characterized by that mind that is the union of karma abiding and special insight now realizing emptiness directly. But bodhicitta is, is the underlying force, not renunciation as before. Now, what happens now is this, what you can do on the path of seeing, it's bizarre, I'm not even, I don't even remember whether I mentioned it, no, I, didn't, I don't think I mentioned it, but... We spoke about this yesterday, like uh, briefly about a person being reborn and there being two reincarnations, mm-hmm. right? Okay, now this is important for the Mayana path of seeing, because on the Mayana path of seeing, <laughs> you got some pen on your cheek. <laughs> never mind, never mind. It's not too bad. Um, <laughs> good thing. Um, no. So the point is, like, once you're on the Mayana path of seeing, you can now. Choose your rebirth, first of all. You can choose your rebirth. You can willingly, you, before through prayer and love, even if you're on the path of preparation, you can kind of direct it. Direct, as in like, you know, I want to be reborn maybe in the human realm, in a particular society, to have the opportunity to benefit others, etc. So um, you have that ability, but now it is through your realization of emptiness through your compassion, the realiza- direct realization of emptiness, prayers, etc., you can actually pick and choose. Okay? So you can so those lamas who can do that, like as long as the Kamaba, he has definitely reached the path of seeing. That level he must have reached, if not higher. But you know at least we don't know exactly which level they have reached, but if they can choose their rebirth, then or as long as the Dalai Lama is said to be able to choose his rebirth. Right? I mean there were he indicated before he died, like his face pointed a certain direction after he died. So the southern direction, I don't forget what it was, eastern direction. So they knew where to uh, look for, like somewhere in Amdo. And a lot of lamas do that. They, they, they have that ability. They are born in certain families um, of their own choosing, basically. All right. Now, that sounds bizarre already. That's already pretty amazing. We can't choose. We can pray, and we can make strong prayers and accumulate virtue. And if we're lucky, we're born in a certain situation. If we're lucky, it means like if all the causes and conditions come together. But not just can they, uh, are they able to choose their rebirth, they can now manifest in more than one, as one, more than one person. They can manifest as more than one person. Now, this is really beyond our comprehension. Like, how can you be more than one person? More okay. than one mind. We are supposed to have one mind. Well, one mind, but that manifests in different people. And the ability of the mind, well, a- anyway, like, we don't need to just have one mind. Uh, once we've talked about the mental consciousness can manifest, then the sense consciousness as well, they can apparently also manifest differently. So here, this explanation that we went through, this is just for ordinary beings. This is just for ordinary beings. But they, a, Buddha, a Buddha can manifest in whichever way is necessary. So the Buddha can manifest as Avalokiteshvara. This is so hard to, to, to fathom. But, of course, it kind of makes sense if you think about it well. We just grasp onto one self. There's one eye we're so obsessed with. So all our energy is directed, our mind, all our awarenesses are all focused on that one eye. Right? So we can only have one body, we can only manifest in one way, and even that, the more self-concerned we are, the less we can reach out, uh, the less we can do, right? Like being able to do certain things and without effort, 
even just as one person, we can't do that. Like as one person, if, if you have really strong self-cherishing and self-grasping, like you're almost paralyzed in what you can do. You're like just focusing on this person, very narrow-minded. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Like really self-obsessed people that think everything is just about them. Everything is just about them. People are talking about them. People hate them. It's like, I know one nun who has, actually, she's a Tibetan nun, she has some mental problems, and those mental problems manifest in her thinking. Everyone thinks she is, is everyone is talking about her. Um, and everyone thinks she's a thief. So when she hears someone talk about thieves, she gets very violent because she thinks they're talking about her. So her mental uh, illness has manifested in a way in which she thinks everything is about her. And she lived in our building. <laughs> she, she, I once mentioned the word thief, and she, she, she just heard me say it, and she threw hot tea in my face. <laughs> yes, but I was wearing glasses, and it was okay, but I got a little bit, um, my, my neck was a little bit burned, and my, tea, my face was a little burned, but it wasn't too bad. The tea had been sitting on the stove for a while, so <laughs> it wasn't too bad. But yeah, she just thought I was talking, and I wasn't talking about her. So, but it, paranoid schizophrenia. Yeah, yeah, that would that would make sense. So anyway, it was for her. It was terrible for her. It was the worst. Anyway, she left eventually. She's still around, but the point is that this is an extreme case where it's just she thinks every, everything's about her. And um, then other cases where you don't have that kind of mental problem. Still, if it's too much, if you're too much thinking about yourself. You can, you don't perceive other people. You don't perceive their lives. Compassion is very difficult. Reaching out is difficult. You know, to do different things, to be there for others, is too exhausting. You can't do that. Now, visualize, you let go of that. Visualize that sense of I, it disappears, right? And so we have this one body as a result of our past lives, of like just being I, I, I. So we take another body, very limited, very vulnerable now they say on that level your mind can expand to such a degree um, that it's not limited in just one body just one place and you can manifest different emanations right and that just goes beyond us that's like again with a i mean if if you think like we're blind and we don't know what color blue is it's like whatever you can talk about as much as you want we don't get a sense for that so the best way to get a sense for that is to generate more love, to work with your self-grasping, and get a sense how your mind feels much more extent, expansive, right? It's like you're no longer dwelling on pity little things, right? You don't know. It's like it, it, you reach out. It's like when you meet people really practicing well, their mind don't get caught up on pity little things, you know, little problems, etc. They're much vaster. They can go beyond those. And this could manifest, therefore, and we already spoke about it, that all the physical that we perceive exists subjectively anyway. So if your mind basically is responsible for the physical manifestations of this world, well, the more expansive your mind is, the more, the better you can physically emanate. Right? It kind of makes sense, despite the difficulty for us. Because we can only think of one person. One, we believe there's an inherent I. How can you think of an inherently existent bodhisattva? The two emanations. It's just our sense of inherent existence really clashes with that. Mm. <laughs> right? Because it's one inherent person. How can you have two inherent persons? Right? So that's why it's so hard for us. But anyway, I'll just give you the, the, the details. So as you move on, you can emanate more and more emanations. Which is why a reincarnation can have two not a big deal, right? That talk about the body, speech, and mind incarnation, etc. Anyway, if it's too much for now, you don't need to think about it much. But just get the logic, like what is the idea behind it? How does our mind work? How does the self-cherishing is responsible for just... The, the more self-cherishing, the less you can do, basically. Okay, And the, the, the less self-cherishing, the more you can kind of reach out. And that could actually... Uh, manifest in different forms of appearance. Okay, great. Hopefully that's a little clearer. So, but the point is here that once you reach the Mayana path of seeing, you realize emptiness directly. So to that as appearance, again, all objects, the mind, the mind, and the, the mind itself, the mind that realizes emptiness directly, to it, 
the object and the mind itself, they become like water being poured into water. There's no sense of distance. There's no duality. There's no sense of distance. There's no sense of inherent existence. No conventional truth appears. So no duality. That's what absent, like a non-dual mind, refers to a mind that realizes emptiness directly. And during one meditative session, you can also eliminate uh, intellectually acquired afflictive obstructions. Okay, as before, like you still need to re- eliminate the afflictive the intellectual. <laughs> Never mind, that was cute. No, you need to still eliminate the intellectually acquired afflictive obscurations, right? You need to eliminate them, and you eliminate them in one go. Okay, you haven't even tackled the innate ones, and you haven't even. Um, thought about, we haven't even concerned yourself with the cognitive obscurations. Okay, so that comes later. So, therefore, first on the Mayana path of seeing, you get rid of the intellectually quiet ones, as is true for the Hinayana path of seeing, but nonetheless, um, of course, when the person arises, they engage in very specific practices, in particular, the six perfections. I haven't even mentioned them, the six perfections. So, gener- the perfection of generosity, Ethical conduct or discipline, patience, patience. patience. diligence or yeah, enthusiastic effort, concentration, concentration and wisdom. Okay, now they are called perfections. Some people don't like the word perfection, so paramita. Paramita really means go, gone beyond, like the one that is not ordinary, that is beyond the ordinary. So again, in combination with in combination with bodhicitta. You practice those in combination with bodhicitta. So, of course, your, your generosity and all the other parameters, um, they're much more powerful because of the drive of bodhicitta. Does that make sense? Can you repeat it once more, please? Generosity? Generosity, uh, ethical conduct or discipline or morality, uh, patience, diligence, concentration and wisdom of the six perfections. So you practice those when you come out of the meditation. And then you reach, again, when you need to become familiar with this mind, the direct realization, you now enter the minor path of seeing. As before, you become familiar with this direct realization and you enter the minor path of seeing. A uh, meditation, sorry. All right. And then on that level, already on the path of seeing, you start counting different levels which are called bumis. Right? Bumis or different levels or different grounds. So you don't have that on the Hinayana path, but on the Mayana path, from the path of seeing onwards, also moving into the path of meditation, so you, you count Bumis. On the Mayana path of seeing, you have the first Bumi, and then, according to a lot of interpretations, the second Bumi starts on the path of meditation, and then you go all the way up to the tenth Bumi. Ten bumis. You have ten. So the minor path of meditation is divided into nine levels. The first level is on the path of seeing, and then two to nine, two to ten, are the other bumis. Because there's such incredible development now on these different bumis. You 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 progress um, all the way through each bumi, eliminating the innate afflictive obscurations. And then eventually going through 8, 9, and 10. 8, 9, and 10 are special. 8, 9, and 10, you're an ahat. Okay? But all under 2 to 10 is under the path of meditation. It's all under the path of meditation. Yes, exactly. So, again, what does it say here? So, the Mayana path of meditation is obtained when Bodhisattvas start to familiarize with the yogic direct perceiver that directly realizes emptiness. As before, so this is similar, the criterion for moving on to the path of meditation. And so in that way, strengthen its ability to now remove the innate afflictive obstructions. That happens similarly to as before, step by step, step by step. But bodhicitta is the force behind it. And of course, when they arise from the meditation, they have already different emanations that go through the same levels simultaneously. may not be obvious to others. Okay. Um, so, therefore, whenever that yogic direct perceiver in the continuum of practitioners on the path of meditation manifests, it eliminates one of the different layers of innate ignorance, other innate afflictions, and their seeds. And then when they arise from the yogic direct perceiver, they continue to accumulate merit by strengthening their bodhicitta, so their bodhicitta even gets stronger. The wish to become enlightened, it has to become stronger. It's not as... as when you first start off with, the bodhicitta is not as strong, and then it becomes stronger, stronger, stronger. 
Um, so it eliminates them slowly to different layers of innate ignorance and so forth. And then once you arise, then bodhicitta, compassion, everything grows stronger. It grows stronger. Even compassion grows stronger. Love grows stronger. Everything. With the attainment of the path of meditation, bodhisattvas also obtain the second bodhisattva bhumi. So during the first, I've mentioned it, but I didn't read it, during the path of seeing, they reach the first bhumi or the first round. It's just a name for a level. And then on the path of meditation, they reach the second bhumi. Then they proceed through the different bhumis, right? Every time they eliminate some layers, they move on, they move on. And there's very specific explanation what happens on each bhumi. You don't need to be concerned with that. It's too complicated. That takes years to really go into all the details. <clears throat> Never mind. And then from the eighth ground onwards, bodhisattvas then begin to eliminate cognitive obstructions. That's when they start to remove. So on the eighth level, they removed all the afflictive obscurations. They're now arhats. But their wish is to become fully enlightened, so they don't stop there. This is the difference between going through the Hinayana path and wishing first to just be self-liberated versus going directly through the Mayana path because you don't stop there. It's like if you want to go from here to Bombay, you have a short stop over in Delhi, but your goal is to continue, right? While if you want to only go to Delhi, well, you reach Delhi, you want to stay there, you want to, you know, do whatever you want to do, and maybe only later on you decide to take the train to Bombay. So I'm comparing liberation and enlightenment with <laughs> Delhi and Bombay. <laughs> but, you know, you have to, you have to go. I mean, if you take the train, you have to travel through Delhi. So that's kind of the idea. So... <laughs> You can take a flight, but that's different. That's Tantra. No. <laughs> that's direct perception. No, but the point, what I'm trying to say is that, oh, we should actually take a break, I think. This is time to take a break now, right? Okay, let's take a break. And then you can still ask questions if you want. Anyway, All right, okay. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so once you reach the eighth bhumi or the eighth ground, then you start to eliminate, or the bodhisattva starts to eliminate cognitive obstructions, that is the smell, that is the inference of ignorance and the other afflictions, by continuing to manifest the yogic direct perceiver that realizes emptiness directly. So again and again, going back and realizing emptiness, removing something, coming back again. So the, the inference, you only need really three meditative Absorption. It's usually like only these three boomies, basically. Whether you need some more is to be seen. But I guess that there are only three boomies, which means you could, within those three boomies, that is three times going into that meditative absorption, you could actually remove them. Well, there's a fourth one that goes at the very end of the tenth, right? But how many they really needed, no one is. And no one specifies that. But there are these three bhumis. But it's difficult to get rid of them in the sense like you have to first reach that level. Your bodhicitta, your love, compassion have to be so strong. Otherwise, your mind realizing emptiness directly cannot remove them. Okay, but you start removing them. Um, and so there's the very last, the very last meditative absorption on the 10th level, on the 10th ground. And when you enter into that, you remove the subtlest, the very subtlest obscurations, and when you arise, you rise as a Buddha. Okay? So that happens on the 10th ground, the 10th level, and a moment later, you're fully enlightened Buddha. That is, your mind is now fully enlightened. All right. And so this is why on the path of meditation, it's called meditation, as said before, uh, you've been, you, uh, you're habituating yourself, you're familiarizing yourself with that direct realization, that's the reason for that name, but other than that you remove anything that is in the way to become enlightened. And then you reach the minor path of normal learning, which is obtained when the subtlest cognitive obstructions are eliminated. The, the ones that prevent you from attaining liberation, they're already attained, I mean the afflictive obstructions, they're already gone. Now the subtlest that keep you from enlightenment, they have also been eliminated. At this point, a person attains the minor path of no more learning, an omniscient yogi direct perceiver, and becomes a fully enlightened Buddha. Since Buddhas have overcome all the obscurations that one must overcome or one can overcome in order to reach the state of a Buddha, this path is called the path of no more learning. Yogi direct perceivers also directly realize hidden phenomena such as the lack of 
of the prominent part is independent self, the 16 aspects of the Four Noble Truth, etc. But there's a difference here with regard to the yogic direct perceiver realizing emptiness. This is kind of, I don't even know why this is there. Anyway, we <laughs> need some urgent editing. Um, but the point is that basically once you reach the, the, the uh, Mayana path of no more learning, you become a Buddha. And your mind has now reached the purest form, the purest state that is possible. Okay? No more obscurations, unhindered love, unhindered knowledge, wisdom, all that. And that's the end. <laughs> okay, so what we can still do... Oh, you missed the end. We're at enlightenment. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. Next time. <laughs> all right. Okay, so, um, yes, therefore, well, we stopped with Buddhahood, I think that's suspicious. We'll still have time for questions, right? Let's take some questions. Yes. Lama stories. Pardon? Lama stories. Lama oh, stories. Yeah. I thought you said Lama yeah, stories. Oh, Lama <laughs> stories. How did you get into... So I get chocolate cake got you here. Oh, thank you for the chocolate cake, by the way. <laughs> Where is the bakery? Where is the bakery? <laughs> oh, the bakery is, it was called Shangri-La. And it's still there, but it's totally different owner, totally yeah, different food, right. different restaurant. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, first let's take other questions that are more specific <laughs> to the topic. Yes? Yes, please? Yes. Simple question: What uh-huh. should be our expectation from the? I mean, what we are taking from this retreat, and vice versa. What should you expect us from us as a student? We what I expect of you? This, mm-hmm. this much and taking. We take this along with us. What I expect you is to become a monk. Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any expectations. I hope mm-hmm. that there's, you know, you take this with you and you don't leave it at that, but you. Continue with your studies. I think studies are really important to get a better sense of what Buddhism is all around. And that hopefully you can bring it into your own life. Make some changes and be happier. And then continue with, prepare also for your next life, even if there's still doubt. Yeah, that I think... And my... So this would be in terms of what I would be... I mean, expectation is too strong a word, but like I'd be happy if that would happen. Um, yeah, and what, what what I would do if I were you, like just what I said, if you find it helpful, don't give up on just that because there's so much to learn. But also, don't think you have to be a monk to learn all this. Um, you can do so much in your free time. Um, learn more about it. Do more courses. You look familiar. You've done you've done other courses before, right? Yeah. So therefore, do more courses. There's a lot available. Definitely make a point. Try to get teachings by his homes of the Dalai Lama. I know it may not seem there's not always that much explanation because there's no time, but if, if there's anyone who's a Buddha, then definitely it's homeless. So make a point. Even if you cannot come to Dharamsala, there are, there are streams now online. You can get them online. If you're abroad, it's a little difficult with the time difference, but if you're in India, it's like the same time. You can record it or you can maybe take a day off three days at the most, because his home is no longer teaches more than three days, or sometimes a little longer. So definitely attend those teachings by the High Lamas. Geshe Dojo Damdu, amazing teacher, who teaches Indians mainly in, in, in Tibet House in, in Delhi. So you can maybe join one of his study programs. They're very effective, very beautifully laid out, and very suitable for someone from the 21st century, for people of this time and age, yeah. I was told last time that if you can arrange around 50 or more people uh-huh. in Delhi or the place wherever you stay, mm-hmm. His Holiness would be more than happy to give a lecture. Well, that, yeah. that you can manage yeah. in a country with more than a billion. Yeah. Sure you can <laughs> get 50 people together. Well, there's something you can do, right? Yeah. Organize more than 50, that would be even better. But that shouldn't be too hard, right? <laughs> get people together. I don't know. You could try, and then don't be disappointed if it doesn't help, it doesn't work out. But maybe some Dharmachi will come, so try that. And if Rishonis cannot come because of prior engagements or feeling tired, well, then probably someone else will be sent. Some Dharmachi is really amazing Lama, 
um, who speaks very good Sanskrit and Hindi and yeah, yes. you know, yeah. yeah. So he's really he puts, amazing. He puts, he puts us to shame when he speaks in Hindi. He's, <laughs> he puts you to shame when he speaks in Hindi. I, I have no idea, but I hear he's really good. Yeah. He's very pure. Like very pure Hindi. Mixed, mixed with English. Very oh, cool. ah, very pure Hindi. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Great. Uh, who's next? Nikita, yes, of course. Uh, yeah. Just a clarification about Bodhishita. Yes. We always start generating it, like we're generating it right now. Mm-hmm. Um, when you do things, when do you attain, like, Bodhishita? When do you attain yeah, Bodhishita? Like when you say, right? Like what is the criterion for generating? Well, if you're totally, like I said before, like you're totally driven by love, like others' well being is more important to you than your own. Any sentient being, any, like even the tiniest fly, you wish that fly to find lasting happiness. It's like that is more important than your own happiness. Of course, you find happiness as a side effect, but that's not your main goal. And then you really, you understand what enlightenment is all about. And based on that understanding, you now want to become a Buddha yourself to be able to fulfill that. And all your actions are basically governed by that, influenced by that, influenced, affected by that. And then rise up spontaneously. spontaneously. You don't have to sit down and meditate. It just pops up all the time, morning, evening, etc. I guess that's when you can kind of tell your bodhicitta. So you said like the bodhisattva vows, like you don't have, if you don't have bodhicitta, how can you give it away? Okay. Right. You, there's one of the vows is such that don't give up bodhicitta, which therefore implies unless you have bodhicitta, you can't take the vow. You can take it, sorry, you cannot receive it fully. You can still take it, but you don't receive it fully. But there's no reason not to take it. Everyone takes it all the time. I mean, everyone knows. But when it's always gives a teaching, a lot of people take it. And it's said to be a great way of accumulating merit and, and leaving imprints. No, I'm just trying to understand. Technically, aren't we all already, don't we already have Bodhisattva? No. I don't know. In your case, I certainly don't have it. And you may have it, but just I told you, is this what governs your life? Like what I just said? Is everything driven by the wish to become enlightened? Are all your actions motivated by the wish for you to become enlightened, to bring the greatest happiness to sentient beings? If you do well, then you have bodhicitta. But if you don't, then there's still some work to do. Yeah, okay. All right. Yes, Sam? In reference to, is that talk bodhicitta, is it talking about spontaneous? Yes, yeah, spontaneous. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But spontaneous, of course, is relative. Like, how spontaneous is that? But kind of like, you don't need to sit down, oh, sentient beings, they really suck, but never mind. Oh. <laughs> 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 I need to do it. <laughs> no, no, it comes pretty naturally. Yes. Sorry, that's what you said. I was wondering what, where you thought, like, because it seems like samsara an activity to create art or to kind of develop the talent or express yourself or, or do research like research in science or anything like that but they seem like kind of activities that can go on forever and they're kind of investment so unlike the other kind of happenings that you say you know you have something that's pleasurable and then it disappears and you notice know, it's absence but it seems like there are some activities we can do that kind of don't have a limitation like that that would still be in some sort. so I wonder what kind of affliction you could describe that as what do you mean, like research? For well, instance? I mean, like people, for example, Stephen Hawking is an example of someone mm-hmm. whose mind was so powerful that it stopped his degenerative disease killing him. Mm-hmm. And people who kind of overcome all kinds of things through self expression or through <coughs> any kind of like big life task, like they see themselves having a task. And they don't seem to be like the kind of afflicted happinesses that, I don't know, I wonder where they kind of sit in this model. I don't know. I have no idea where they are at, where Stephen Hawkins was at. No idea. I can't say. I guess you can only say yourself, right? What kind of happiness? So this is all about, that's the problem with, there is a scientific aspect of of Buddhism, of course, where your own mind becomes your own, what is it called, uh, petri dish. But of course you can't kind of go and compare it with, kind of take another person and say, look, what is my mind? I really can't tell. And I think, you see, if I say uh, this kind of happiness, this kind of restrictive happiness, I'm not saying stop that right away. 
you, you can't do that, right? I mean, start where you are, basically. Like, is there, are you very attached? Uh, that's our question. Like, that's what we need to ask ourselves. Am, am I very attached to my own samsaric happiness? So anything to do with the four, eight worldly dhammas, but um, summarized into four. Into Pardon? It's just an innate drive to like it. Yes, it's an innate drive. I see that. But that innate drive can be reversed. You can change and, and start a new innate drive. I'm not saying it's easy. Remember, in the beginning, it's like this road with lots of potholes. It's, it's like you can hardly come, go, move forward. So that's a little bit intimidating in Dharma in the, when you start about learning about Buddhism, especially when we stop with Buddhahood. Right? It's like, whoa, I'm still so attached to my samsaric happiness. And they're talking about something that is so far beyond me. So we shouldn't be intimidated by that. But just kind of check where, where should I be focused? What should I be focusing on? What is my main issue? In terms of the afflictive emotions, really. Is it more anger? Is it more envy? Is it more arrogance? Is it more... And then just slowly, day by day... Take a step at a time to check first which afflictive emotion is making my heart difficult, my life difficult, which, which one disturbs my uh, relationship with other people, right? Which creates the greatest worry. So to start in that way, without thinking too much about what a Buddha does, no, no more attachment, that's, that's too far beyond. Does that make sense? So just look at your own mind, your own life, reflect upon your own mind, your own life. What can I change? Which changes can I make right now? Which changes can I not make right now? So look at those with an honest mind. Be honest to yourself. Generate the sense of distance a little bit without getting sucked in and feeling guilty and, self, and develop self-loathing and all that. No, just look at your own life and see what can I change. And then once you make those changes, it gives you self-confidence and you go, wow, this actually worked. So what can I do next? Right? So everything you've learned so far... Try to find a way to integrate that, but be also aware, or d know that the main focus of Buddhism is working with our afflictive emotions, reducing them by way of applying antidotes. And just continue studying the Dharma if that interests you. Yeah. If something else interests you, well, do that. But if the Dharma interests you... I guess, yeah, I guess what I mean is it seems like there are things you can do that have no afflictive effect. Ah, uh, no, I think from a Buddhist point of view, it's all afflicted, right? It's pretty much, I mean, the self-cherishing, it's ever-present. As, as, as long as that is ever-present, how could it not? It can be less strong at times, but if it's still there, potentially it could always grow stronger. So it's good to definitely work towards totally overcoming it. Does that help? Yes, William? I was kind of, like, for me, like, uh, I'm under the impression that you, I use, try and change the intention, use my skills for the benefit of others. And Beautiful. try and change it from that self-cherishing. Nice. Mm -hmm. I think that's, like, mm -hmm. if you look at someone like Elon Musk, right? Mm -hmm. like, I remember him Elon coming. Elon he's, he's kind of like, awesome. I just do, I'm just That's working for other people. Yeah. Oh. It's just like, he's like, you know, he wants us to go to Mars and stuff. He's just like, I'm just trying to be useful. Oh, okay, you know very nice, I mean? beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's so productive. Ah, oh, beautiful. I think William makes a great point. Start off with, try to get yourself to do it for the benefit of others. I mean, that's already really advanced, but if you can take that step and, and really get your mind, fake it until you make it kind of idea, initially it doesn't come naturally, but you can change that, then things start rolling. I think it's quite beautiful. I mean, you have a job that is already... Right, you're working with yeah. several people, so that's already in and of itself. But even if you're not having that kind of uh, job, that from the outside doesn't seem to be a socially kind of I don't know what you would call it, like a, it's a social type of job, still you're contributing to to society. And even if you go traveling, may that be a benefit to other sentient beings. If I learn new things, have new experiences, that may help other people. I may open other people's minds to new experiences through what I tell them, etc. So really uh, adopt that kind of motivation. That's very beautiful. That Wake up in the morning and just try and do that. And there's a book that may help you to do that. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yes? I've seen that you often refer to films a lot. 
what, what do I do? You offer, often you refer to films a lot. To films? Yes. Films? Like yeah. movies? Yeah. 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 Films in yeah. Movie documentaries yeah. or your movie Oh, like movies, yeah, films, also films. Okay, yes, 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 okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then you tend to have a certain opinion about a Rinpoche filmmaker. I have so certain opinions about Rinpoche? Uh, oh, a filmmaker, Rinpoche. Who wrote uh, What Makes You Not What Makes You Not Zonsak and Zonsak Cancer. Zonsak Cancer. Yeah. You have an opinion about that. Ah, oh, oh, oh. oh. A filmmaker. Ah, now I get it. I don't like. Oh, initially, no, no, no. The, I initially I thought for Rinpoche to make movies, like I had that wrong view initially about him. I thought, oh, he's not interested in the Dharma. He's just interested in in movies. That was my wrong perception before I knew what these movies were about. Anyway, and I I didn't think he was like learned or anything. I think I thought he was just interested in making movies. But of course, I was totally wrong, as so many times I've been so totally wrong. So this is just a good example, where. My, my preconception was, was not in accordance with reality and that he turned out to be such an amazing person just from what he said, such an amazing teacher, such insights. And so ever since that time, I've sometimes listened to his teachings. They're really funny, <laughs> so really humorous. But he says these things. You know, this is, I believe, how you can tell whether someone has, someone has realizations when they don't use the usual examples Right, repeat mm. re examples of other people, but from his deep perception, he uses examples that are like so obscure sometimes. It's like, what? But you realize he's totally brought the Dharma into every aspect of life. So he translates the Dharma into like examples such as laser beams and so forth because he has full comprehension of it. So to him, the Dharma is ever present, and any example he brings up the funniest examples. Um, never mind now, I'm not going to start <laughs> to giving examples. But, and then I, I realized, wow, that's amazing. It makes me laugh first, and then I realized he took that example and he gave it a new meaning because he saw the Dharma even within that. So now I've changed my mind totally about him. But yeah, initially I was like, oh, he's not the only one, I have other stories, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. What else? Pardon? Uh, yeah. Like, just Google yeah. the book, what does it mean not to be a Buddhist? Yeah, and then, what, what, what makes you not Oh, what makes, makes you, you a Buddhist? And then they add it. But they add, I know, but they put the not in, like, like oh, yeah. right? They kind of add it. So the real is like, what makes you a Buddhist? But it has, like, the not. If you Google that on Amazon, and then it has his name on there, and you know how to spell it. <laughs> Yes. Um, so I asked this question before, but I'll chuck it in now. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, I was just thinking about, because it sort of relates to what people are talking about, about um, kind of great artists, great geniuses, and I was thinking about someone like Beethoven, who who had a, 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 a no ear sense power, mm -hmm. and yet had a, a genius mm -hmm. in his field. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of curious on your take about when someone doesn't have the sense power that motivates the ear consciousness, mm. and, you know, create some of the greatest pieces of music that have been written. Mm. What what's kind of how did how, how do you, do how it? does that work with in terms of you know where does the where does genius lay? In which is it in a sense consciousness? Is it in our mental consciousness? Is it, is it kind of you know mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about him but just yes, yes in general I know what you yeah, I guess what you mean. I get I think it's the mental consciousness. Okay. I think it's the mental consciousness assisted by, of course, the sense consciousnesses, but it lays mainly in the mental consciousness. And if you're born with that, it is a result of a previous karma. So, for instance, if you think of Mozart, like this incredible child being able to do these things, well, from a Buddhist point of view, there is great virtue that, he, that Mozart in a previous life must have benefited a lot of sentient beings with what he did, and as a result of that, he had that unique ability. Now, if you continue doing that, he continued to be reborn with that. Maybe if he stopped doing that, it, it may degenerate. So the point is that it comes with a mental consciousness. But the mental consciousness also means you have a, you're born with a certain brain. Because the mental consciousness from the previous life also determines, together with the karma that ripens based on that mind, what kind of brain you have, what kind of sense powers you're born with. So possibly... 
have a different brain from someone else, even very different from his parents, although same DNA, but very different from the parents. So, like I said, the brain, the mind, the mental consciousness also creates, the mental consciousness from the previous life, that also creates, that is responsible for what body we get, what brain we have, and it is mainly the mental consciousness, of course, but very much assisted by the sense powers. And how did most? How did Beethoven did it? Well, he had good hearing before he turned uh, deaf, right. and of course, there's vibrations. Like vibrations are involved too. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I remember seeing a video once of a girl who was deaf, but she when she sang, she learned how to sing. She wasn't deaf her whole life, so she had a good voice and mm-hmm. sang until a certain age, and then she became deaf. But she had training and be able to use her voice such that it didn't sound odd. Sometimes when people are deaf, they may they don't hear their own voice and cannot really adjust it. But she learned to sing really beautifully, and she couldn't hear anything. She was playing uh, kind of like a little guitar thing. I don't even think it was called that, but it was, it was like this tiny thing. And she had these drummers around her, and there was a bass. She took off her shoes before she started singing. So she took off her shoes so she could feel the vibration and was able to go with the rhythm of the music. So she didn't hear the music. She felt the music through her body consciousness. That reminds me, I still haven't done that motion thing about the balance and stuff. Some questions I couldn't answer. I apologize for that. Didn't have enough time to. But yeah, anyway, sorry, to, as a side note. But this is how I see it. I guess. This is my understanding that in this case, she still had the vibration. She could go in through that as that is as that example so did beethoven i mean the music probably he had a very strong conceptual mind that could play it in his mind i mean oftentimes these compositions they take place in their mind or great artists they probably see the image before they've actually put it on paper right so there's already some something that that's the mental consciousness and then you translate that what you perceive like you use your body, you use your yeah, ba- basically your body to put it on paper or to to write it down in the form of music. So it's astounding, but that's what the mind can do, yeah. right? Yeah. Can I ask you a related yes, question? Please. I mean, I saw this um, these clips on Facebook. <laughs> uh, there was this man who had an accident or a stroke or something. Yes. And then when he came back after that, and before that he didn't know anything about music, okay. and he came back oh, yes, from yes, that yes, and yes. he starts playing these things and he has no idea how he has Yes, this is also a very interesting case when people have some brain damage or some change to the brain, whether it's a damage that's of course relative, but some change to the brain. I told you about this tough English guy, you know, hanging out with his hooligan friends, and then he went to the bathroom because his friend was coming and he pressed too hard because he wanted to not let his friend wait and he had a stroke on the ba- in the toilet. Went into a coma and when he awoke he became this incredibly sensitive artist, right? Like before he was this tough guy and still he could see, you know, the tattoos and the way he kind of was like just his face, you know, just like a kind of a tough guy, right? And suddenly he became this super sensitive person. So what happens in that case? Well, my guess is that he also had the karma to manifest in that way. He'd also created causes for that. So different causes and conditions coming together. So when that brain, as serving as a basis, had changed, then through the sense consciousnesses and so forth, then that mental consciousness could manifest. Okay? So he created the causes in a previous life that this sudden change happened. Could it be that in his earlier case, his body was dominating over the mind? No, I think the mind, his culture, his upbringing, etc., that was probably definitely played a part. So he had this karma to be born in a certain environment and be influenced by it. And he, I mean, not everyone is influenced. I mean, I meet people... Who, who live in a certain environment and are not influenced by it, and others are. It just depends on all the different kinds of actions we've accumulated in the past coming together and in that, in that way. Um, yeah, so possibly tendencies that come from the body, from the brain, etc. And then because of that karma, having the, uh, having the karma for that change, who knows, maybe the mind changed first and then the brain did too. I mean, it could have been, we, we think of it as this way around, like, First the brain changes and then the mind changes because that's all we can observe. But it could have been that the mind changes and that led to this sudden, what we call a stroke, 
right? What else we're going to call it? It actually was a positive change in the case of the past, maybe in your case too, right? And then I wonder about um, multiple personalities, like people who, who suffer from multiple personality disorder. Well, that is also like different. You have created, it's not like you have two people. Maybe there's like, it's also possible that sometimes, I mean, that there's this English word possession. Um, it exists. I mean, if you want to see a very good documentary on this, it's called The Oracle. There's a documentary called The Oracle. It's a one hour uh, documentary on people here who have other beings go, go into them, like the Kandrala, the, the famous Kandrala, who's famous for her spiritual abilities, of course, but also this, this lady, this lay person. Um, so she, her name is not Kandrala, but she's called Kandrala as a sign of respect for her spiritual abilities. And she also has a special kind of being enter her, and now she's learned to control it. Initially, it just happened randomly. This wholeness showed her how to control it, and she goes into a trance, and this being takes over. So there's Nechung. It happens to Nechung, right, the oracle. Um, so he's unconscious during that time. His mind is no longer working. So it is possible that another being enters our body and takes over, okay? In her case, it's a positive kind of karma, and you can, I mean, in this documentary, it's shown so clearly how this happens. They show you how they go into trance. And with Nechong, I mean, I've seen Nechong going into trance. It's not, he doesn't pretend. You see, the thing is, they, when he goes into trance, they put this head on. It's 20 kilo, 20 kilo, and they tie it very, they make it, they tie it very tight around his throat. If that was still the ordinary person, it would suffocate him. They, they have to kind of keep him grounded because there's so much power. So the moment he comes in, his whole body blows up. He looks differently. He's got this strength, right? And you can feel this. It's like he's shaking and this very heavy head. And he's just like moving around as if it was, I don't know, a, a, a basketball cap or something. And then the moment the trance is over, they have to right away loosen it because otherwise he dies. So there are always monks around him. They, they watch him. They realize they, they see the trance is over. And then he falls over, his head falls back, of course, 20 kilo, he goes, his neck goes backwards, because he can no longer hold it, it just ticks back. I don't know how he wakes up, with what kind of pains he wakes up. So it just goes, tuck, it goes back, and they open it, take, remove the head. And he's totally exhausted afterwards, like, he's like, he's coming out of, because his body was used by this powerful being, right? The energy in his body was like, and he's exhausted when he comes back, and he has no memory. So... There is a case where another being enters your body because of a strong karmic connection. And so it's possible sometimes when people have these disorders, if there's a strong karmic connection with another being, that they can actually enter you, right? And the lamas can help you to stop that. I mean, a lot of lamas have that ability. And sometimes there's nothing we can do. It is what we've done in the past. We may have harmed someone in a certain way, and we right? Need to live with it, and unfortunately, right? So it could be so many different things. It could be another being, right, kind of taking over in, in the case of multiple personality. It could just be you've created the karma to have both scenarios, be this artistic person, be this not artistic, and then it switches. And we just, we look at it, we look at the, the change in the brain. The only thing it comes close to is a stroke. We call it a stroke. And in the end, we don't know what's happened, what was first. No idea. Maybe the mental consciousness, as it switched, it changed the, the brain. And so it's so interesting when you hear about multiple personality disorder, when people need glasses, when they, I remember one lady, she turned into a five-year-old girl every now and then, right? She was a mother, and then this five-year-old girl came through, and she couldn't wear glasses because she could see perfectly. So they had to always put on the glasses, take off the glasses, because she could see, she could not see. So in my, I would say that the mental consciousness affects affects the body in such a way that the optical nerve you know like when you what happens apparently um when you can no longer see without glasses that your your nerve cannot it cannot like when you see something close enough somehow something kind of i don't forget the words now but something pulls together to such a degree that now like a like a photographic like a lens in a so you can see nearby clearly but you you lose that ability as you grow older <laughs> Right, so you you need glasses now because it can no longer your optical nerve cannot be adjusted. 
But here in this case, when this other mental consciousness comes through, probably the optical nerve is now working properly because of the mental consciousness. Yeah? So then it's a different personality. The optical nerve works now with that mental consciousness. And then an hour later, when the other one comes through, she needs to put on the glasses again. And I did a lot of research on that. They can't explain it. There are lots of theories. So from a Buddhist point of view, it can be explained. It's just how the mental consciousness is affected by our actions of the past. Sometimes more so, sometimes less so. Okay? That's how I look at it. I don't know. But more research needs to be done. Yes, to I. Um, our mind can have only one focal object, right? One mind at a time? I think, yes. It's probably, I think ordinary mind, it would make sense that just one mind at a time is one focal object. I'm asking because of what you described earlier about... Uh, What's going on with this today people leaving? Is, did you have any food, special food? <laughs> Seems like a lot of weak la letters. Sure. Ah, yeah. When is the lunch? 12. 12. Okay. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So, uh, being a emanator? Emanator? Like in two bodies. Ah, when someone emanates into... Oh, but yeah. well, that's different. Once you're like highly realized, I mean, like have reached that level of what is described as highly realized, I think you can have more than one mind. But I don't really know how that works. Is it like you're like a, they're all puppets controlled by one mind, or have, do they have individual minds? There's some debate on it. I would rather think they're part of this one person, right? Part of this one person. So it's like the mental consciousness, of course, can kind of uh, branch out. So there, it branches out. It comes from the same person, um, but nonetheless, um, it's the same continuum, but it manifests differently. So that is it's so high up there that is different, right? And I cannot really explain it. There's not much explanation on it. I guess it's not much explanation on it because for us, it's not really necessary to understand it because it's beyond us anyway. And once you're there, you get it anyway. You don't need to learn about it, right? That's my take on it. Alex? Because when, uh, when they look for reincarnations, mainly they, they look for the reincarnations of the mind. But I've been explaining a little bit that there is also, like, for Azel, for example, uh -huh. who's seen as the man of the uh -huh. Many emanations, also, for yeah. example, the reincarnation of the speech. Yeah, in the body. Mm -hmm. I've been seen in Europe as well. Mm -hmm. so, but is it that just something from time to time, or in general, they know they look for the, the, the mind? Yeah. And you they know somewhere else, you know, sometimes they just have the the clue that they can also have been touched with the speech. Or. I don't even know what that means, the reincarnation, like the emanation of the speech and the emanation of the body. I mean, what does that even mean? Like, like, I don't know. I think it's because we look at a person, like the body, speech, and mind, like we, we, we perceive like the three doors to communicate. Maybe it's just a symbolic thing because like how could the speech just be reincarnated? That doesn't make sense. No, it's just a... I don't know. I have not. I don't know. I haven't really thought about this. I haven't really researched it. But the thing is, like the reincarnation of the mind. Well, it's all reincarnations of the mind, right? Usually, they look for one, assuming there's one that definitely continues on. And sometimes, when another one displays similar aspects, then somehow they determine, oh, that's also a reincarnation of that same being, because somehow they they talk about their previous lives. They they manifest certain signs. I don't know, it goes into something mysterious that I'm not aware of. And they don't publicly talk about it. So those very high lamas, when they get together, that they decide that, right? So, but there's no doubt that the two reincarnations of like the uh, Jamyang Kenzo Wangchu, I think his name was, he has two incarnations. It was Dugu Kenzo Rinpoche and Zonsei Kenzo Rinpoche. And Dugu Kenzo Rinpoche passed away, but he was considered to be one of the emanations, and Zonsei Kenzo Rinpoche is still around. Both are considered to be emanations. And they're super special. Where Dugu Kenzo Rinpoche was super special, Zonsei Kenzo Rinpoche is extremely special. So they've definitely recognized the right thing, and the right person. But I don't know all the details. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. sorry. Yes? Um, when you divide bodhicitta into conventional and ultimate, what does ultimate bodhicitta, like why is it called ultimate bodhicitta when it's not absolute bodhicitta? <laughs> ultimate bodhicitta, okay, there is something called conventional bodhicitta and ultimate bodhicitta. Conventional bodhicitta and bodhicitta are the same. Conventional in the sense what appears to you is conventional truth, sentient beings, you, your own enlightenment, like your own enlightenment appears <laughs> as that which you aspire towards for the benefit of sentient beings. 
then ultimate bodhicitta is the mind that realizes emptiness directly conjoined with bodhicitta. It's that when you, like it's on the path of seeing, on the Mahayana path of seeing, just directly realizing emptiness is not ultimate bodhicitta. It's the mind that realizes emptiness directly that is conjoined with bodhicitta that is called ultimate bodhicitta. Why? Because it's a mind that takes you towards enlightenment not by way of what you aspire towards, but by way of eliminating what's in the way to becoming enlightened. So the mind of enlightenment as in like a cause to enlightenment, but from the point of view of wisdom. Now, bodhicitta really means the mind that is a cause to become enlightened, like the main cause. The two main causes, the wish to do so, and that which removes what's in the way. Therefore, it's called ultimate bodhicitta, because its object is an ultimate truth, and it's the other main cause that takes you to enlightenment because it's conjoined with the aspiration, the wish to become bodhicitta, to become enlightened. That is conventional, conventional bodhicitta. Does that explain it? Yeah. Okay. Like, is that the same as aspiring and engaging? No. As, aspiring and engaging bodhicitta are two forms of conventional bodhicitta, what we talk about as bodhicitta. Aspiring bodhicitta is when you have not yet taken the bodhisattva vow. Before you take the bodhisattva vow, you have not made the promise yet. And like Ashanti Deva says, it's like you wish to become enlightened. You wish to go. It's just the wish to go. While when you take the vow, then the mind receives this drive where you're more actively moving towards enlightenment. So that's called engage. That's like when you really start walking. So it's said that the vow gives your mind an extra drive so that you're more actively moving towards enlightenment. With aspiration of bodhicitta, you, you want to become enlightened for the benefit of sentient beings, but the mind doesn't have that drive yet because of the vow, not, not having received the or not having yeah received the vow yet. Okay, that's a little technical. Yes, please. Uh, so when we say this person is a lama, uh, what stage of the path is he? Is that person on, and how do we how do we know that that person is a lama? We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know what level. Let me ask you something. When you were five, when you were five year, five years old, could you differentiate between a kid of first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade? You couldn't tell, right? You couldn't tell whether a child was just from their communication, like the way they acted towards you, maybe from their size. Well, other than that, from their mental state, as a five year old, you couldn't tell this person's first or seventh grade, eighth grade. You couldn't because your mind was not as sophisticated as these children, was not as developed as these children. So once you get reach seventh grade yourself, you can pretty much tell, oh, this person must be in a lower class just from the way they talk, etc. You can tell once you're on the same level. So likewise, in spiritual practice, those who are pretty much on your level, you can identify them. But when it comes to a lama, no way. It could be higher, it could be lower. We don't know, especially because it doesn't show in terms of their physical appearance. Of course, different grades, you grow bigger, etc. So only the lamas can really know. Now, if we trust the lama, they have no reason to lie to us. Usually we trust that. But Tibetans always have a healthy sense of skepticism. Okay, it's a lama, they're respectful, just in case. Uh, but they're also in the back of their mind, okay, I'm not totally relying on that person. I want to first see when they grow up, who they, do they grow up to be? And then once they're mature enough, how do they behave? How do they teach? What kind of effect has their teaching on my mind? Right? And sometimes there may be some of, maybe a really high lama. So just to be safe, people are respectful. But we should be respectful towards anyone anyway. Because we never know who's a high lama, who's a Buddha, who's not. But even besides that, so if you assume someone is a high lama... Um, you may not have a karmic connection with that person. So you don't go to teachings. You don't go to, right? You don't read their books, etc. You choose someone who you have a strong connection with, whose mind affects you, right? You walk away and you feel, wow, I heard those same words from someone else. Didn't have the same effect. It's not so much the words. It's much more as part of our communication with other people anyway. There's a karmic connection that we have with someone and then with a highly evolved spiritual being, they may use very simple words. That's why I say keep, keep getting teachings from His Holiness, even though the words are like you've heard it a thousand times. 
it affects you differently every time. And as Holmes had said, you can even take a tantric initiation via the internet. You receive it. If you're fully qualified. You can see it. So he gave the special permission for that. Plus, it communicated, his special qualities are communicated in a slightly different way. So really, you can only just guess. But if someone inspires you and you really want to learn the Dharma because of this particular Lama, well, then you know, right? Yeah, so you don't need it. It's okay even without really knowing. It's okay. And if you, if you believe they're a Buddha, right? If you believe they're a Buddha and you've investigated well, they don't start doing suddenly weird things, becoming turn out to be a serial killer, because that would be traumatic. So you really need to check well. Like for 12 years, they say, in, in Tantra, you check for at least 12 years. So even if you don't check that much. But once you reach a certain point, even if you see them as a Buddha, you get the full benefit of bene- on, on relying on a Buddha. You get the blessings of the enlightened mind through this person. So there's a great book by Lamas of Rinpoche who explains all this, like how to rely on the teacher. What is it called? Heart of the Path. Pardon? I think it's called Heart of the Path. Heart of the Path? Okay. It's big and blue. It's big and blue. <laughs> yes, it's big and blue. I remember it's big and blue and has a picture of Lamas of Rinpoche. Or is it like a sunset or a sunrise? Yeah. Uh, I thought it was just plain cover. Ah, okay. I thought there was some sunrise was or something. Early, early release. Ah, okay. Anyway, look for a big blue book by <laughs> Lamas of Rinpoche, and then he explains it much more about the Lama, etc. It's quite beautiful. And you know what it is? It gives you emotionally. It's got this. It, I don't. I can't even explain it. This kind of devotion um, that you find, of course, in other beliefs too, in other t- religious traditions. I don't know. It gives you like a sense of being protected. It gives you a sense of meaning. It gives you great joy. There's so many emotions that come together that you get through a lama, and it's you don't it's it's not even you don't even have the wish to be around them, like it's there's no wish to rub shoulders with them. It kind of that that goes away. If they look at you, it's fine. They don't look at you, it's fine. It doesn't matter because you connect with them mentally. Thinking about them, you connect with their mind. I don't even know how to call it. I'm almost thinking of it. They're like this huge huge boat and you're like this draft and you're kind of hooking onto their mind just mentally and you get pulled by that so this is the power of the mind of a lama it is not restricted like in our case and you mentally connect to them and you're inspired just thinking of your lama ah it gives you so much joy and that joy is a totally different joy than ordinary joy and it inspires you to practice so this I think is very important so to look for a lama I can only recommend that as in like you, it's not like you, it's not like there's one hiding somewhere and you look for them in that way. But as in like making that connection, think as one as the Dalai Lama, you're very safe with him. So make that connection, listen to teachings, etc. I didn't have it with his holiness at the very beginning. But the Lamas of Rinpoche it was stronger than with his holiness. But it developed over the years, right? Listening to teachings again and again. Okay, great. To talk with other, other students as well. Pardon? To talk with other students of these teachers because. This yeah. is how you get also the information and yeah. why do you, what is it that you see, like when you see members of with animals, with frozen shrimps and blessing them, you know, it's like, yeah. there's nothing, he doesn't breathe in or breathe out for, us, mm-hmm. for himself. Yes, so yes. You hear stories about them. And yes, yes. that's true. That's a beautiful way of looking. Yes, that's why we read their biographies, or if we don't have their biographies, we have the stories that other people share with us, these amazing, amazing stories when they do certain things and it blows your mind. Right? There's so many stories of his holiness, the Dalai Lama, for instance, and of course of other lamas too. Beautiful, inspiring stories. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, a, a lama is recognized as children, or is it something? Pardon? How, who gets called a lama? Like how, how do we? Oh, lama. Hmm. It's there, there's certain in some traditions. For instance, if you do a three-year retreat, you're called a lama. Okay, it's kind of more, it's like a title that you get after having done a certain retreat. This is in a different, it's a different tradition, and you need to be aware that it's different to this tradition here, for instance. I think it's mainly in the Kagyu tradition where they call, yes, I, I probably also in Nyingma, I'm not so sure, but Kagyu definitely. So they give this title Lama. However, in the Gilupa tradition, the word Lama is not used in that way. They don't give that to a person who's done a certain amount of retreat. So, um, a Lama is 
it's translated as spiritual teacher, but not just a teacher on, on Dharma, not a Dharma teacher, but more than that, someone who really lives, who have incorporated the Dharma in their life and don't just talk about it. I make someone who just talks about it. But like, I'm serious. So, so there's some who really live the Dharma, like Lamas of Rinpoche, for instance, and they don't have to be Rinpoches. A Rinpoche, like his Honda usually does that, you know, Whoever is a Rinpoche doesn't have to be a Lama. Whoever a Lama is a Lama doesn't have to be a Rinpoche. There's someone who's both a Lama and a Rinpoche, and there's someone who's neither. Okay? So a Rinpoche is just someone, they call them Rinpoche, it just means greatly uh, precious one. So they are beings who were recognized to have done something in a previous life. So that could mean that they're not really the reincarnation. They're recognized, but they're not. In most cases, they are. But even in that case, it may not come through yet. It hasn't come through yet. If they're very little, they don't show the aspects of a lama yet, so you wouldn't call them a lama. And then there are those who were special in their previous lives. Some don't want to be recognized. They don't want to be recognized. They make prayers not to be recognized because they feel that being this incognito, like this situation of not being recognized, that gives them the opportunity to live a very simple life and continue with their practice. So it just depends how many students they have, if there's the wish to reconnect with them or seeing the importance of that or not. So you could have lamas who, I think Jetsuma then Zimpamo, she's a lama. You asked, you asked, okay, remember? About women. So there are great women like Jetsuma then Zimpamo. Um, in the Western tradition, there's also a Rinpoche called Kandro Rinpoche. There's Kandro La, right? There's her. So just if someone is called Kandula, doesn't mean that Kandula. Like here, the, the, don't be. The, it's just a name. But in the Tibetan society, oftentimes they don't call a woman Lama. They call her Kandula as just a different word, right? So, um, but you also have the ordinary name. There are lots of women called Kandula, and they may just be shopkeepers or just ordinary. I mean, n- nuns who are not have don't have that title. That's just a name. But, like, our Kandula here, whose picture you've probably seen, she's a lay person. She has a different name. Her name is, she has a different name. But as a title of respect, everyone calls her Kandula. And there's Kandu Rinpoche also. Also, she has a different name, but again, out of respect, they call her Kandu Rinpoche. So, there are these women, definitely, who manifest as lamas and who have this from, a pre- from their previous lives. I mean, Denzel Pamo, I keep saying that with Jitsuma. 12 years in a cave doesn't make her special, right? It is pretty special, but it doesn't mean you were 12 years in a cave, you necessarily... She was special before that. I believe she had these qualities before that, and they just got enhanced. And even though now she's not in retreat as such, but she continues to be this amazing person and evolving, etc. So, yeah. Um, so there are female lamas as well. Kumping coming in, what does that mean? <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Um, have we have we answered all the question? Have all guys' questions been answered? Lama stories. Lama stories. <laughs> Can we do some know some Lama stories? I mean, I know some. I know there's one Lama story. I tell you the one that I didn't tell you last time of Kitty Rinpoche. It was so amazing. So <laughs> it's all about visas again. Um, <laughs> So one time, this, uh, this was in the connection to the other visa story I told you, but apparently one time they had to travel as a group of monks, including Rinpoche, to Nepal um, because there was some important event, but one of the monks didn't have a passport and they traveled by a plane. And so, <laughs> and this was, those were times when you only had to show your passport once at the, um, at the immigration. So the story goes that the monks that were present there, they said Rinpoche was reciting this prayer very intensely. He was looking right, right, back, like right and left. And only, there were five monks and only four passports. And the passport person, like controlling the passports, was like starting to count it. Getting really confused, like more and more confused, more and more confused. And then in the end, he got so confused, he was like, just go, 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 go. And there were five people with four passports. Now, this is people talking about it who were present there. Like someone saying they were present at the time. I heard it from a monk who said they were there. And yeah, remember she just did this and, and they got through. And it wasn't just to cheat, etc. They had to really get to Nepal for some important religious event and the passport didn't come through early enough. So that is one story. And there are many stories like that. 
um, where you just have a thought, you think about something, and then the Lama walks up to you and say, well, by the way, such and such. And you go, whoa, right? I told this story yesterday uh, about um, Lama Zubramji, when one of my first experiences with him, and this is my first personal experience, I was just a face in the crowd. I went to Kopan to do a course there, and I didn't know Lama Zubramji. I went there actually for another teacher, Kitty Sencha Rinpoche, I just mentioned him, and Lama Zubramji was there, and he blew my mind. But I was no one. There were hundreds, 100, 200 people, more than 100 people in that course. It's like a huge tent. It was before they had the hall. And we were all in there. And Namazu Prabhupada didn't, couldn't, like, I didn't stick out or anything. He didn't know who I was, nothing at all, from what I, from just ordinary appearance. And then one day I got quite sick. And um, I got sick. And the nun who lived, who was next to me, I was next to a nun in, in the dormitory, and she had an audience with Rinpoche that evening. And she didn't mention me. I mean, she had her own stuff, and why would she mention me? She didn't know me either. So, and Rinpoche said, here's a little gift for the nun who sleeps next to you. That was me. So she had no one on the other side. It could only be me, because that was the wall, and that was me. Wow, she gave those socks to me. I was like, oh my God, these socks, when she gave them to us. So amazing. And then I was better, actually, I got better that night. I had taken some Tibetan medicine and I got better. And the next morning, there was first there was morning meditation and I was still too weak to go. So I kind of woke up, everyone was leaving. I was like, no way, I have to sleep. I knew I had to sleep. So I fell asleep again. And then it was Kitty Tendur teaching. So I thought, oh, when I woke up again, I was like, no, I'm really comfortable. I don't want to go. I could go, but I don't want to go. So I was like, well, you know, no one was there. No one could see me. So I fell asleep again. And I had this dream. Lama Zobram, she said, get up. <laughs> and I got up. I was like, oh, my God. I put on my clothes and I ran to the teacher. <laughs> I never had a dream like that. It was so vivid. Like, it was almost like he was shouting in my ear, right? And it never happened after that again. No one woke me up in that way ever after. And never before that. And I ran to the teachings. Anyway, that evening, Rinpoche had left the compound. And I wanted to thank him for the socks, at least, right? And I wasn't going to walk up to him in any way. I thought just, just as he walks past me, I could maybe say thank you for the socks or something. Anyway, there were two roads that Rinpoche could take to go back to his room. He would usually take the left as part of the circumambulation, but I couldn't find a spot there. So I stood on the, on the other side, which he usually doesn't take. So I thought, okay, I've tried it. I, I can't kind of squeeze in. That w would have been inappropriate. So I just stood there. But that time, Rinpoche took the other road. And he stood in front of me. He said, how are you? And I said, oh, thank you, Rinpoche. Thank you for the socks. Uh, I'm better. And that's it. And he's like, okay. He moved on. <laughs> like, come on. Like, coincidence? Like, I don't know. How did you know I was living next to this nun? How did you know I was lazy and I didn't want to go to the teachings? Well, maybe that was just my dream, okay. But how in the evening, how, you know, it was like, and it happens over and over, and there's so many little things when it comes together that it's like, well, either there's some weird coincidences happening, or really, they know your mind. And they're so gentle and so kind in the way of doing it. I'm sure there are hundreds of stories. Everyone has their stories. Venerable Droma has definitely hundreds of stories in the same way, hearing, well, you know, tens of different ones. I mean, you know, many different ones. So all of us have these stories. So, yeah, and those are very inspiring. That's why I think we should have some kind of Lama story app or something, like a WhatsApp group, <laughs> right? Like when it, some of the older monks and nuns, like they have great stories. When it, Max, for instance. used to tell Lama Yashi stories Lama Yashi on his birthday at Rajapani because there are a lot of old students at oh, Lama Yashi. Oh, how lovely. Yeah. So Lama Yeshe, yeah, he was like that. He had these amazing stories. So the old students of Lama Yeshe on his birthday, they would come together and share stories. Mm -hmm. And it's so inspiring. Look, I mean, you're inspired, aren't you, by what you've heard, by his holiness stories, etc. So there's some it's amazing... Lama Yeshi just came out. 20, oh. years, 20 years of making... Yeah, 20 years, something like that. Oh, of stories like that? Yes. yes. The biography, the whole life of Lama Yeshi. Yeah. So oh, lovely. All the old students. Oh, lovely. John Landau, who he edited? What's the name? I'm not sure, but... I What's the name of the books? Um, I'm going to call it. Um, I don't know. I, I put the card at checkout. Yeah, I brought a card from France. They yeah. were just announcing that it came out. Right, okay. Okay, wonderful. share this book with Jin. Uh, he, it's what, what he was asking about. Okay, sure. So this is, uh, Jin, this is Tim. Tim, Tim sorry. 
Tim. Uh, so this uh, train your mind, train your brain. Have you read this book? No. So it is about the neuroplasticity of the mind, and what you were asking that like like there's a uh, there's research done that when one of the sense powers is, does not exist, mm. then which part of your brain takes over? And they've done research, <coughs> unfortunately, on monkeys uh, when it was still allowed. Mm. So there there are these instances of artist who's completely blind from birth and she can paint in perspective. Mm -hmm. Wow. Amazing. And uh, how does she do it? Mm. And there are some of the Mind Life series with His Holiness. Mm -hmm. They're also in this. So this is a book which would really answer some of your questions and raise many more. Can you read yeah. the title and, and yeah, the author? Train Your Mind, Change Your Brain. Train Your Mind, Train Your Brain? Oh, great. Okay. It's in the library here. Train your mind, train your brain. Okay, great. Okay, all right. Should we do a dedication? Yes. I thought to read the dedication here from... Is it in here? Is there a dedication? Oh, yes, there's. All right, let's do the dedication. Trying to do a dedication prayer. Is that right, Kumpin? Do we have time? And do first the prayer uh, for the long life of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Is that in here? Oh, it's not in here. Okay. Because, I mean, usually when you do this prayer, you actually focus on all the lamas to, to make prayers that may they be, may they um, stay around, may they be, uh, well, what's the, what's the word, may they have a very long life. So all the different lamas. So we could just maybe, without reading the prayer, uh, and then we do the, the prayer here, the, the, this is the Chantideva prayer, yes. Um, we could do the dedication prayers, may the Supreme Jewel Bodhicitta this, and then we read the, the English underneath it, right, on the last page, page 22 and 23. And then before that, to now think of all the merit that we have accumulated together here, whatever positive potential we have accumulated here as a group, working with each other, asking questions, of course being very skeptical, analyzing, meditating, Everything we did as part of this course, may this first of all uh, become the cause for all the great spiritual teachers who are still on this on this earth, who are still with us. Um, may they have a very long life. May they continue to teach the Dharma. May they continue to inspire other sentient beings. And of course, even after they've passed on, be reborn again somewhere where we have access to them, so that we ourselves can transform our mind, learn more about it, get to know it, transform our mind, so that eventually we reach the highest state of a Buddha. We ourselves reach the awakened or attain the awakened mind of a fully enlightened being, so that we have greater, greatest benefit of all other sentient beings. So with this thought in the back of our mind, let's read the dedication prayer together. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. No, no, then underneath. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy, by virtue of my merits, may no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose minds are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food, May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, May they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid 
and those bound to be freed. May the powerless find power, and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> you were a great group. You were wonderful. Like really nice, nice, uh, nice, nice. What's the word? Social interactions. The way you got along with one another. The way you were uh, very caring with one another. That was very beautiful. That's not always the case. Well, who's uh, your favorite? Who's my favorite? <laughs> <laughs> Me. <laughs> anyway. So, um, therefore, I'd like to thank you for that. And the course was only possible because of all your great inputs, your great questions, your interest, your faces, your expressions that I've been watching. <laughs> okay, anyway, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. And, of course, Venerable Droma doing such a wonderful job leading the meditation and everything. She's been so amazing. So. Thank you. <laughs> I give that back.